Now the prospect of living longer has enticed humans probably since we were first conscious. And for that reason, there's a lot of skepticism that we'll be able to achieve this goal because so many people have failed until, uh, well, even till now, we have very little way of improving our health or living longer. So why am I optimistic that one day we will live much, much longer and healthier? Well, one main reason is that in other organisms, it's turned out to be rather simple to extend the lifespan of those organisms. And I really don't think that we're that special when it comes to life forms on the planet. Going back about 25 years, the idea that uh, you could do something about aging and slow it down was considered crazy by most people. And I would say today still that's a, a standard view. Now, the, the view that gets in the way of that is that our bodies are much like cars, where machines that are extremely complicated, of course, we're much more complicated than a car, than a car but we're still, we still have this view largely that our bodies are machines that wear out over time and break down and this is what causes aging. Now if that were the only uh, truth to aging and to biology then of course we would have no chance of slowing down this process because let's say I came up with a pill uh, or someone developed a drug that could um, keep part of our body healthier for longer. Well, some other part would still break down, and that's actually how we practice medicine today. We prescribe a drug for cardiovascular disease, but this does nothing for Alzheimer's. And this is the real problem that we face. Now, by that car analogy, turns out 25 years ago, uh, there was a, a number of discoveries uh, in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, that said that maybe there's something more to this idea than just a car breaking down. What we now believe is that our bodies are uh, more like, uh, if you want to use that analogy, we are like cars, but our bodies have inbuilt repair mechanisms that can be brought to life with molecules or genetic manipulations. So instead of just thinking we wear out over time, we actually have inbuilt repair women and men that, that are working uh, to keep us healthy. So what that means is if we could find a genetic way or a pharmacological way to get these repair people up earlier in the morning or to uh, work harder, we would have a way of keeping our automobile, our bodies healthier for much longer. Okay, so that now means that uh, it's at least feasible that we could have uh, an elixir of youth, something that could make us live a bit longer. So why am I so optimistic that we could live much longer one day? No, not in, our, in my lifetime, I don't think in most people's lifetime, but one day. The reason is that a number of labs around the world um, have made discoveries that single gene mutations, just changing one gene, in some cases just one base in a sequence, is enough to extend lifespan dramatically. The best example I can give uh, is work from labs such as uh, the Kenyon lab, Ravkin lab, uh, Johnson labs. They found that mutating the genes in a simple worm, a little nematode worm called C. elegans, or C. arabis elegans, C. arabidis elegans, that this can, uh, this little worm that's about a millimeter long, uh, can live twice as long with just one mutation in its genome. Uh, that gene uh, those genes in that pathway turned out to be related to the insulin signaling pathways that exist in our bodies as well. And there's a lot of work that's going on to try and understand how that pathway in our bodies could also be manipulated to make us live longer. And there's increasing evidence actually from centenarian studies, these are people that in their families tend to live over 100 years, that this same pathway in the worm uh, is also important for making us live long as well. But this one genetic change, or this one genetic pathway that I'm talking about, isn't the only one that's important for lifespan in the worm, and probably isn't the only one important for lifespan in humans as well. We now know that there are dozens of important pathways that we've discovered in these simple organisms like worms and fruit flies. Um, 
and even now in monkeys, that are able to delay aging quite dramatically. So how do we think that these genes work? I'm often asked, aging is really complicated. How can these genes extend lifespan? Well, it gets back, get back, gets back to that analogy about the car and the repair people. What we think is that these, what we call longevity genes, control these repair people. So instead of our bodies working you know, an average nine to five job, keeping our cells healthy, what these genes do when they're altered is trick the body into thinking that there's a, an adversity coming or there's not enough food, there's not enough DNA repair. What that does is it tricks the body into mounting this stress response and repairing cells better. It's as though you make a phone call to the repair shop of the car. You say, uh, um, the car, um, it really needs to be repaired. It's, it's smashed. Quick, get everybody out of bed and work harder when actually everything's perfectly fine. But they get, they polish the car, they make sure everything's working well. And that, we think, would keep our bodies healthier for much longer. So that's actually a really um, novel discovery, um, as I say, only in the last 20 years or so, that we've realized that there are inbuilt repair mechanisms in not just our bodies, but all of life. And these genes that I'm telling you about, the insulin signaling and others, are found in all these life forms. Now, another question that's interesting is why would these genes exist in the first place? And why aren't they switched, if they exist, and we know they exist, and then if so, why aren't they switched on all the time if they're so good for us? Well, what we think is that they evolved to counteract adversity and keep these organisms and ourselves alive for longer when there's not enough food around or there's some other stress. You can imagine back in um, two billion years ago in the primordial soup when the, the life forms are swimming around, um, early life forms, um, even some of the simplest cells, they needed a way to adapt when their conditions became harsh. Let's say there wasn't enough of a certain molecule available. Well, they developed ways to respond to that stress. And what we found is that these genes that are very ancient are found in all life forms now. And when organisms such as ourselves, or even little worms, they don't get enough food, or they don't get enough vitamins, they don't get enough amino acids, that tricks the body or tells the body to get into a state of super repair. So why aren't they switched on all the time? Well, you don't want the body to always be in a stress response. That doesn't make sense. There are times when there's plenty of food or nutrients available. Then what you want to do is switch off these pathways and allow the organism to do other things that it needs to do, such as grow, get bigger, multiply, and reproduce, produce offspring, which is, of course, essential for life. And we think that these genes come on and off depending on whether the environment is harsh or not. Now, that leads me to uh, my last point, which is uh, what are these genes telling us about a very interesting diet known as calorie restriction? Since actually the early 20th century, it's been known, and you could argue earlier than that, that Restricting the amount of food that animals get makes them healthier. And we've known uh, for the last, uh, for, for millennia, that fasting is, is healthy. And that's still you know, true today. The first rigorous experiments were done in 1935 by McKay and colleagues um, and they, uh, in the US. And they found that restricting calories of rats uh, by about 30%, 30 to 40%, uh, greatly increased their health and made them live longer. And this was really a, quite a dramatic finding and it's been studied ever since by people who want to understand how to slow down aging. There are people today who are calorie restricting themselves in the hopes that it will make them live longer, though we don't yet know if that's going to happen. But calorie restriction is amazing because it's, it's the most reproducible and robust way to extend lifespan in very different organisms from these little worms through to monkeys, in fact. So what we think is going on under here, under the, the hood of the, of the car, is that the diet is tricking the organism into thinking that 
the conditions are so harsh that it has to constantly repair its cells. These genes that I've talked about, the insulin signaling and these other so-called longevity genes, um, they respond to the lack of food and they come on and, and these defenses come on. And then the final thing to think about is what are we doing to our bodies by always having food available in our society? We're very rarely hungry and fasting for most of us is something we do rarely if ever. I think we're doing to our bodies is that we're shutting down these ancient defense pathways that would normally keep us healthier. Perhaps one day we will find molecules that we can take as a pill, for example, that will, instead of having to go hungry to fast all the time, we could pop a pill that would tell the body, or tr at least trick the body, into thinking that it's not getting enough nutrients or enough food, and it would turn on these inbuilt repair systems, these innate defenses that exist in our bodies, and those would keep us healthier for longer. And perhaps when we're in our 90s and 100s, we could still be healthy and play tennis with our great grandkids and teach them all the wisdom that we've, we've uh, accumulated over the decades. Maybe one day we could live twice as long like that little worm was shown more than 20 years ago. And if we live in a world like that where people live healthy, longer lives, I think it would be a, a much more interesting and productive um, world to live in. And actually, I think they would, those people will look back at today with some sort of pity that we only live these, these short, relatively unproductive lives.